Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on uh, etiology and clinical presentation of type 1 diabetes in children. This is the first among a series of webinars on pediatric diabetes, which will be delivered twice a week, leading to World Diabetes Day on 14th November, whose theme this year is access to diabetes care. My name is Dr. Priska Amolo. I am a pediatrician and endocrinologist at Kenyatta National Hospital, and I will be the moderator for this session. Our speaker for today is Dr. Phoebe Wamalwa, who is a pediatric endocrinologist at Kajiado County Referral Hospital. Dr. Wamalwa is, uh, was our pioneer fellow in the Pediatric and Adolescent Diabetes and Endocrinology Fellowship Program at the University of Nairobi under the Kenya Pediatric Fellowship Program. She is passionate about improving quality of care for children and adolescents with uh, diabetes. So we will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So kindly send your questions in through the Q&A box. Dr. Omalwa, the floor is yours, Karibu. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Priska, for the kind introduction. I hope I'm audible and um, my screen is um, visible. Yes, you're audible and we can see your screen. Okay, thank you so much. So thank you again for this opportunity to just take us through the introduction to diabetes. As you've heard, we're going to have a series of um, uh, CMEs on the same. So today we shall just stick um, to basically looking at the history of diabetes uh, definition. We want to look at the etiological classification of diabetes, um, a bit on epidemiology, etiology of uh, type one diabetes, which is actually our focus and um, briefly touch on pathophysiology and how type 1 diabetes presents uh, in children and um, young adults. And then later on, we shall briefly touch on um, other types of diabetes, um, but not in details. So looking at the history of um, diabetes, the term diabetes was first coined by um, the gentleman by the name Eretius of um, Cappadocia in um, 80. 1 to 133 AD. And it basically means to go through or siphon uh, because the disease um, drains more fluid than consumed. And the word melitus, which is um, um, a term that means honey sweet, was added by Thomas Willis in 1675 after discovering that um, uh, there was sweetness of urine and uh, blood of uh, patients who were affected with diabetes. The two entities of uh, diabetes, that is type 1 and type 2, were identified by um, as a separate condition for the first time by Indian physicians in 400 to 500 AD. So um, this picture basically portrays, um, is, is a, a photo of um, um, a 14-year-old boy by the name Thompson. And you can see on the left, these are 14 year old, but very emaciated, wasted, and appears very small for age. And this boy uh, had been diagnosed with diabetes and he had been put on um, dietary management where basically it was restriction of diet before insulin was discovered in 1922. After the discovery of insulin, he was put on it um, though it was impurified, but you can see the drastic change from a wasted young boy to a chubby young boy here. So um, in January 1922, insulin was administrated to uh, this 14-year-old Thompson, and uh, the treatment took place in Toronto Hospital. Um, and then you can also see in this next photo, again, uh, this is a boy who Basically, it's really wasted um, on the left. But then after initiation of insulin on the right, you find that now the boy um, is looking chubby and well-nourished. So the definition of diabetes is well known to a number of us. But I'll just go through for the benefit of all of us. So it describes a complex metabolic disorder that is uh, characterized by chronic hyperglycemia. So mark the word chronic hyperglycemia. And um, this hyperglycemia results from either defects in insulin secretion or insulin action 
or both. So basically, uh, there could be impairment of secretion of insulin from the beta cells of the pancreas, giving you type 1 diabetes, or there could be resistance to the effect of uh, insulin in the liver, muscle, and fat cells, um, giving you type 2 diabetes. But as we shall see much later, type 2 diabetes may actually uh, present because of resistance and also secretory defect. So how do we diagnose um, diabetes? And it's good that uh, when I was joining this, I saw the first question that came into the chat was, how do I make a diagnosis in a, a resource limited setup? I mean, a rural hospital. So how do I make a diagnosis without a laboratory? So I think this is a good place to be at. So you can make a diagnosis of diabetes if a patient presents with classic symptoms of diabetes, and that is polydipsia, polyuria, weight loss, or the patient could have presenting hyperglycemic uh, crisis, which could be diabetes to acidosis or HHS, with a plasma glucose concentration of more than 11.1 millimoles per liter. So when you see these classic symptoms, and a hyperglycemia of more than 11.1 millimoles per liter, then you can make a diagnosis of diabetes. You can also make a diagnosis if the fasting plasma glucose is more than 7.0 millimoles per liter. And fasting here is defined as no caloric intake for at least eight hours. You can also make a diagnosis of uh, diabetes after you have conducted um, what we call an oral glucose tolerance test. So this is where you uh, it's a dynamic test where you give uh, a patient 75 grams of anhydrous glucose, and then two hours later, you check the sugars. So if the sugars uh, come to more than 11.1, then you can make a diagnosis of diabetes. HPA1C also has some value, especially if it's more than 6.5%. And uh, HPA1C is basically glycosylated part of hemoglobin and represents uh, the sugar load of over the last three months. However, looking further on HbA1c, it's important to know that a value that of less than 6.5% uh, does not exclude diabetes diagnosed uh, using glucose tests. And uh, HbA1c alone in diagnosis of type 1 diabetes in children is um, unclear. There are instances where you may find that the HbA1c is falsely high. And uh, these instances include um, cases where you have increased red cell turnover, but the, the, the red cell turnover, sorry, is low. Or in cases where um, we have iron, vitamin B12 for folate deficiency anemia. So here you can actually get increased uh, HbA1c because there's increased half-life for the RBCs. On the contrary, you can get falsely low HbA1c if there's rapid uh, red cell turnover, like uh, what occurs in hemolytic anemias, or patients who are treated for iron, vitamin B2, folate deficiency, or patients treated with erythropoietin or uh, hemodialysis. So it's just important to take note of that. And then the next uh, term we are going to look at is impaired glucose tolerance and impaired fasting glucose. And these are not interchangeable. They're actually two different entities. So IGT and IFH are intermediate uh, stages in the natural history of disordered carbohydrate metabolism. So it's basically between normal glucose homeostasis and diabetes. And in um, intermediate, fa um, impaired fasting glucose is a measure of disturbed carbohydrate metabolism in the basal state. So whenever you take uh, fasting glucose and you find that it's impaired, meaning that the sugars are between 5.6 uh, and um, 5.7 and 7, then you call that impaired fasting glucose. And impaired glucose tolerance is a dynamic measure of carbohydrate intolerance after um, a glucose load, uh, where you give your 75 grams of um, anhydrous glucose and you find that uh, the levels are not more than 11.1, but they are more than 7.8, then you can make a diagnosis of impaired glucose tolerance. So individuals who meet the criteria of impaired glucose test or in, uh, impaired fasting glucose may be glycemic in their daily lives and may have normal or near normal HbA1c. 
Um, and so these two entities are referred to as prediabetes. And whenever you make a diagnosis of prediabetes, then it is a warning sign and um, lifestyle modification is banned. So this slide basically gives us the summary of what we are seeing. When you're talking about a patient who has um, impaired fasting glucose, it means that the fasting plasma glucose is between 5.6 and 7 millimoles per liter. A patient who has impaired glucose tolerance has um, the glucose levels of between 7.8 to 11.1 millimoles per liter after the um, glucose load. And uh, um, HbA1c of between 5.7 and 6.4% uh, is referred as uh, pre-diabetes. On the other hand, as we had mentioned already, uh, you make a diagnosis of diabetes if the fasting blood sugar is more than seven or um, uh, two hour plasma glucose during your GTT is more than 11.1 or hemoglobin um, A1C is more than 6.5% or the patient has classic symptoms of diabetes and a random blood sugar of more than 11.1 millimoles per liter. So moving swiftly to etiologic classification of diabetes, the American Diabetes Association proposed a diabetes classification system that includes four categories. You have type one diabetes, type two diabetes, gestational diabetes, and other specific types. And we shall go through each one of them but not in details for some. So type 1 diabetes is as a result of beta cell destruction, usually uh, leading to absolute insulin deficiency, and it can be as a result of um, immune-mediated mechanism or idiopathic. Type 2 diabetes may range uh, from insulin resistance with relative insulin deficiency to predominantly insulin secretory defect with insulin resistance. And that's why you see the recommendation of use of insulin in patients with type 2 diabetes. Uh, gestational diabetes, on the other hand, is associated with uh, pregnancy. And then we have, uh, fourthly, other specific types of diabetes. And these ones are quite many. So you'll just, uh, I'll, I'll request that you go with me. Um, so the first um, specific type of diabetes we're going to look at is um, diabetes that comes as a result of genetic defects of the beta cell function. And this uh, could be as a result of uh, perhaps a defect in the potassium in one rectifying channel or a, a, a problem with uh, the glucose uptake in the beta cell or um, the transcription factors. And a number of them, a number of these defects can either give you neonatal diabetes that is either transient or permanent it can also give you um, what we call MODI or um, maturity onset diabetes of the young. We shall briefly touch on that before we finish. And you can also get mitochondrial diabetes, uh, basically presenting with diabetes and sens sensory neural uh, deafness, and it's maternal, uh, maternal inherited. And then the second subtype is um, as a result of genetic defects in insulin action. And you can get all these syndromes you can see here, including lipoatrophic diabetes. And these are quite um, uh, rare types of diabetes that we rarely see. Then diseases of the exocrine pancreas can also give you diabetes, and this include pancreatitis from whatever cause, a trauma or pancreatectomy, malignancies, cystic fibrosis, which affects uh, quite a number of systems or organs, and infiltrations like hemochromatosis can also give you diabetes, uh, including fibrocalculus, pancreatopathy, and we have many others. Endocrinopathies can give you diabetes because of um, the counter-regulatory action uh, on insulin, basically causing insulin resistance. So anything that increases the growth hormone levels in the body, um, or Cushing syndrome, uh, glucagonoma, fucromocytoma, aldosteronoma, and others can actually cause insulin resistance and hence present with uh, uh, diabetes. However, it's important that once the, the cause has been uh, treated definitively, then there may be reversal of diabetes. Then drugs or chemicals may also induce diabetes, and we have drugs that can cause both insulin resistance and deficiency. 
and these include uh, drugs like glucocorticoids. Uh, we have antipsychotics and protease inhibitors, especially the first generation. And then drugs that cause insulin deficiency include beta blockers, pentamidine, thiazide, diuretics, and many others, including the azoxide. And we have also drugs that um, basically cause insulin resistance, like the beta glucagonic agonists and growth hormone. Then infections like congenital rubella cytomic galovirus have also been shown to cause diabetes. And some genetic syndromes like Down syndrome, Pinfelter's, and Turner's syndrome have been associated with diabetes. Children who have undergone transplant, organ transplant, may also present with diabetes as a result of uh, various factors, including the use of immunosuppressive agents post transplant. And we also have um, are rare forms of immune-mediated diabetes, including um, anti-insulin receptor antibodies and um, APS1 and 3. So having said that, I will go straight to type 1 diabetes, and that is basically the main uh, reason as to why we are here. But allow me to just share the um, history of um, this young man called um, Langahans. And in 1869, he was a student in uh, a medical student in Germany, and he, he discovered two systems of cells in the pancreas. Number one was the asini, which he knew that uh, they produced pancreatic digestive uh, secretions. But there was another system that he wondered what it actually does. So the function was unknown to him. But then later on, uh, Mikoski and Merin in 1889 were two German researchers uh, were testing how human body uses extra fat. And what they did was they eliminated the pancreas of um, a research laboratory dog. And what happened later was the dog developed polyuria and fetal diabetes. And uh, later on, when they an analyzed the urine for the sugars in the dog, they actually found that the urine was sugar. Um, and then now, uh, uh, Baring and Best in 1921 extended the Mikoskis and Merings experiment, and they went ahead and isolated insulin from the pancreatic cells, um, pancreatic islets. And uh, in 1922, they ad administered to patients suffering from type 1 diabetes. And if you remember our very first patient, Thompson, in 1922, he received impurified insulin from the dog's pancreas, and that's what his uh, what saved his life. And so this uh, discovery later on saved the lives of millions, and uh, it uh, uh, ushered us into a new era in diabetes treatment. So briefly looking at the um, the pancreas. Um, so the pancreas is this organ you can see here in orange lying transversely across the abdomen, retroperitoneally. So anteriorly or above it is the stomach. And then uh, on the left, you have the liver. And then on the, on the, on the left, on the right, yes, we have the liver. And on the left, we have the spleen. So the pancreas is divided into three main parts. We have the head, which is engulfed by uh, the first portion of the duodenum. We have the body. Um, that is just above the uh, inferior vena cava, and then we have the tail that touches the spleen. 98% of the pancreas is basically comprised of an uh, exocrine and ductal system. Islets of Langerhans only comprise 2% of the pancreas or the pancreatic cells. And out of these islets of Langerhans, uh, we have the alpha cells that sec secrete the glucagon, and uh, beta cells that secrete insulin, delta cells in autostatin, and we have pancreatic polypeptide. So the fathers of uh, the fathers of uh, insulin are the ones who discovered discoveries of insulin are basically here, Bantin, MacLeod, Best, and uh, Colif, and we attribute the success of um, treatment of diabetes to them. So going further into to look at the type one diabetes. Um, it's a chronic immune-mediated destruction of pancreatic beta cells. 
and the words to note are chronic and immune mediated. So this distortion of the pancreatic beta cells lead to partial and in most cases, absolute insulin deficiency in children and young adults. However, patients will become clinically symptomatic only when around 90% of the pancreatic beta cells have been destroyed. So basically this is how a normal looking islet looks like. And then on the left, we have beta cells that uh, have been destroyed in a patient who has type 1 diabetes. So overall, looking at the epidemiology of type 1 diabetes, it's actually been on the rise. And approximately 96,000 children under 15 years are estimated to develop type 1 diabetes annually worldwide. And an estimated 24 million adults are aged between 20 to 79 years were living with diabetes in the International Diabetes Federation African region in 2021, those are 27 countries, uh, giving a regional prevalence of 4.5%. However, more than half of the people living with diabetes in the African region are undiagnosed. And the question that we have is, where are these patients? Are they dying because of misdiagnosis, because of you know, being labeled as malaria, pneumonia, as we shall see what is happening to them. Um, so between 2011 and 2021, the region has recorded a five-fold rise in type 1 diabetes among children and teenagers below 19 years. And cases have surged from initially 4 per 1,000 children to nearly 20 per 1,000. And this is massive because if you're looking at the Kenyan population, youths um, are basically around 25 children of pediatrics and um, young adults or youths comprise around 25 million of the general population. So if you're talking about four per 1,000, you're basically talking about um, close to 100,000 people living with type 1 diabetes. Now this one has surged to 25,000 giving us a scary figures of close to 500,000. But do we have these children, have they been diagnosed? It's food for thought. The study that we recently conducted in uh, Kenyatta National Hospital, just as we looked at the uh, spectrum of endocrine disorders from 20, 2008 to 2021, shows a gradual increase of type 1 diabetes over the years. I'd want us to ignore this descent from 2009 to 2013 because there was a problem with the records and the number of files were lost here. But you can see from 2013, uh, we have had new cases of diabetes every year. Uh, the new uh, newly diagnosed patients have been increasing. Of course, there was a dip in the year 2020 because of COVID, but later on in 2021, there was a, there was a sharp rise. So definitely this should be telling us something. So what is the etiology of type 1 diabetes? A big question. It's important to know that it's multifactorial. First of all, uh, patients who are genetically predisposed, meaning that they have HLA uh, haplotypes or some haplotypes that are an HLA are at an increased um, risk of getting type 1 diabetes, as we shall see very soon. Environmental factors um, would increase the risk by causing a trigger in autoimmunity in genetically predisposed children. And once they have this environmental trigger, which could be infections, certain infections, uh, nutrition or chemical, um, and then we have autoimmunity that now causes the uh, downward spiral in terms of the destruction of the beta cells in the pancreas and hence type of type one diabetes. So looking at the genetic predisposition, it's important to know that the overall risk of type 1 diabetes in the general population is 0.4%. It's not high like type, uh, type 2 diabetes. And familial aggregation accounts uh, for approximately 10% of cases of type 1 diabetes, but there is no recognizable pattern of inheritance. When we are talking about familial aggregation, we're basically looking at a great-grandfather who has diabetes, 
a father who has diabetes, an uncle, an aunt, a sister. So you don't see this familial aggregation as much in type 1 diabetes, unlike in type 2 diabetes. So if a, a patient has type 1 diabetes, then the sibling to this patient has only around 6 to 7% a lifetime risk of developing type 1 diabetes. And this risk amongst the siblings is the same as the, non the risk to non-identical twins. However, if we have identical twins and one develops type 1 diabetes, then the other identical twin has a risk of up to 70% of developing type 1 uh, diabetes in the lifetime. If a mother has type 1 diabetes, then the risk of her children getting type 1 diabetes is just 1 to 4 percent. And if a father has type 1 diabetes, the risk of the children getting type 1 diabetes is 6 to 9 percent. However, it's a different story for type 2 diabetes, and we all um, know that. So when you look at the genetic predisposition, we are looking at the susceptibility to uh, type 1 diabetes as determined by a number of polymorphisms in uh, a number of genes. And HLA genotype confers approximately 30 to 50% of uh, uh, the risk. That is the human leukocyte antigen uh, phenotype. So for patients who have these HLA uh, genotypes, and especially these ones that are labeled here, we don't have to cram, but at least the ones who have BRFB1, BQA1, um, after genetic uh, screening, these ones are uh, have the highest risk of developing type 1 diabetes. However, we also have non-HLA genetic contribution, including uh, uh, the insulin PTP N22 genetic um, uh, defects that can actually predispose somebody to type 1 diabetes. Now, um, type 2 diabetes, uh, basically patients who have genetic variants in the transcription factor 7, like uh, 2 blockers are the strongest genetic factor. But just like type 1, it's polygenic. And for uh, the genes that um, increase the risk of type 2 diabetes are so many, extremely many, we have not really um, gotten a uh, zero to uh, a few there. Quite a number. So when it comes to the environmental trigger, the triggers, we have hypotheses and um, various hypotheses that have been fronted um, that act as environmental triggers. And here we are looking at infection, uh, nutrition, changes in the microbiome, or uh, certain chemicals that are thought to be associated or precipitate immunological reaction and, and hence development of type 1 diabetes. And this process usually begins months to years before the manifestation of the clinical symptoms. So what infections have been uh, thought or have hypothesis to increase the risk for type 1 diabetes? We have enteroviruses, um, Kokosaki, uh, rubella viruses that can be gotten during pregnancy or in infancy, childhood or adulthood. And they have been associated with development of islet autoimmunity. And what these infections, viral infections also do, they actually cause inflammation. Uh, so once the beta cells become inflamed, they change the, their shapes. And once they have changed the shapes, then the, the antibodies in the body will recognize them as foreign antigens. And so auto reactivity or autoimmunity will also be, uh, will also. Um, not proceed from there. Then cow's milk, a lot of studies have gone into this uh, to basically look at um, uh, cow, how cows, if cow, cow's milk increases uh, the risk of type 1 diabetes in genetically susceptible individuals. And there's a very large study that um, was done for a period of around 12 years in multiple countries to basically just look at um, the use of highly hydrolyzed uh, formula vis-a-vis -vis the conventional formula and the increase in the risk um, amongst the genetically susceptible individuals. However, the results did not show an increased risk, but we have other studies that looked at uh, exposure to, uh, to infants at around three months of age. Uh, so when you expose the cow milk to these children who are genetically predisposed as early as three months of age, 
um, this study shows that there's some increased risk development of type 1 diabetes. However, we need more studies to uh, give us a conclusion on that. Vitamin D deficiency uh, is also a very interesting subject, but it has been shown to increase uh, uh, the prevalence or increase risk of autoimmune diseases, including type 1, but the exact mechanism is not well understood. Um, then we have the clinical hygiene theory. Uh, again, this is inconclusive, but you can see a country like Finland, which is very, very clean, has um, one of the highest prevalence of type 1 diabetes. So the question we are asking, does it play a role? And we need to get answers on that. So when you're looking at the natural history of diabetes, we've talked about a child who is genetically predisposed, has certain HLA or non-HLA uh, haplotypes. And along the course of this child's life, we have a trigger, environmental trigger that causes immune activation. Immune response, of course, involving mainly the T cell lymphocytes, followed by a development of certain onto antibodies, which could be single or um, more than um, uh, two auto antibodies. And of course, now with subsequent destruction or gradual but continuous destruction of the beta cells. So you'll find that once the beta cells have been uh, destroyed to a certain percentage, uh, you may find that in stage one now, you have a normal blood sugar, but when you test the autoantibodies, the islet uh, uh, diabetes associated autoantibodies, you may find that they're actually positive, more than two are positive, but there's no dysglycemia. So that is referred to as stage one diabetes. In stage two, now we start having dysglycemia and a patient also has uh, more than two autoantibodies. In stage three, where now around 90% of the pancreatic cells have been destroyed, then you find uh, that the child develops overt diabetes, and that's the time you make a clinical diagnosis of uh, diabetes, again with positive antibodies. And then stage four is long-standing type one diabetes. So what are the diabetes-associated autoantibodies? We have what we call GUD65, we have IA2 antibodies, IAA and zinc transporter eight um, autoantibodies. And these autoantibodies can actually be analyzed uh, locally. And they are basically serological markers of beta cell autoimmunity. So moving to pathophysiology of, uh, type, uh, of diabetes. So usually the insulin gets secreted from uh, the pancreatic islet uh, cells. It enters the blood circulation. Uh, where it meets glucose that has also been, um, that has also entered the bloodstream from the digestive tract. And so there's a healthy balance of insulin and glucose. So insulin eventually leaves the bloodstream, binds to the insulin receptors on the cell to cause some signaling activity of the glucose transporter, molecules that now cause the um, glucose to enter the cells. For, glyco for glycolysis in the Krebs cycle to produce energy in form of ATP. That's how a normal cell functions. However, in type 1 diabetes, there's insufficient insulin. So you'll find that we have um, less insulin. And so the signaling pathway and um, the signaling pathway is uh, diminished with eventual dimin uh, diminished glucose uptake of, uh, by the cells. And so what you eventually get is hyperglycemia with starvation in the cells. So I'm going to use this diagram, which um, um, I borrowed from Dr. Mungai. So let's assume the cell is likened to a house. And as, as you can see, this is a very beautiful and very calm, contented house with an open door. And what you can see inside here is we have clean fuel in terms of firewood. And you can see the chimney there, which is like, which is uh, acting as the Krebs cycle. So because the door is open, glucose can enter, that is the fuel. Glycolysis can take place in the Krebs cycle and we have ATP and this energy production, clean fuel. We do not have any issues with the cell, this growth and development. However, in cases where we have insulin deficiency, 
what happens here is the, the, the doors are closed. The doors to the houses are closed. And what you can see littered here uh, in the capillaries is the fuel. This is the firewood that we need uh, it to enter the cells for glycolysis to produce the energy, but it's not able to enter the cells. As a result of that, there is no energy that is uh, formed by these cells. The cells are sad, they are starving. There's no heat, they are cold. And there's starvation that now starts to, to occur because the fuel or the glucose is just circulating in the blood, but is not able to enter the cells because insulin is not able to open the doors for them to enter. And so what happens here? The cells must get an alternative source of energy. So since we do not have glucose because of lack of insulin, so we find the cells now are burning down whatever alternative fuel they get. It could be the curtains, it could be the bed sheets, anything. And you know, this is now basically the fat cells, uh, the muscle, proteolysis, lipolysis. So as these alternative sources of fuel get burned, what you can see here is this formation of bad smoke. So this bad smoke is the ketones. Because of lipolysis, this formation of ketones in form of uh, beta hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, the acetone, with an increase in the pH, uh, with a reduction in the pH in the body acidosis and subsequent um, physiological actions, as we shall see. So it's important that uh, we have insulin to ensure that glucose enters the cells for glycolysis to take place. So this is basically a summary of what we have been saying. Um, that in patients who have type 1 diabetes, they actually don't have insulin. And that one um, causes a number of uh, processes in the body with resultant re uh, increase in uh, or re release of counter-regulatory hormones in form of catecholamines, glucagon, cortisol, growth hormone, as you can see. And what happens with these hormones is, number one, they'll reduce uh, utilization, there's re reduced utilization of glucose because firstly, we don't have insulin. And so the glucose is not able to be utilized by the cells. And there's also release of counter-regulatory hormones. And so uh, compounding the effect of that. So reduced utilization of glucose will result to fatigue. So patients will present in OPD with fatigue. At the same time, um, because of alternative, uh, because uh, of uh, increased counter-regulatory hormones, there is now breakdown of glycogen in the body. There's gluconeogenesis from amino acids, from glycerol, and there's also lipolysis. And all this will lead to hyperglycemia. When there's increased uh, blood sugar levels in the body, there's a rise in extra cellular hyperosmolality. With this rise, it draws water from the cells, causing intracellular dehydration. And so the patient develops thirst and hence polydipsia. Increased hyper, uh, glucose levels again will lead to glycosuria once the renal threshold of uh, more than 11.1 has been reached. And this causes osmotic diuresis, hence choleria, leading to dehydration. Hyperglycemia again will cause increased uh, sodium chloride loss. Uh, with the reduction in sodium uh, levels in the body, there is a release of aldosterone. And aldosterone will cause retention of sodium, but increase the loss of potassium in urine. And so these patients will have hypokalemia. Remember, there's also concomitant lipolysis that is happening. And so we have production of ketone bodies. So there's ketosis, there's acidosis. Um, so because of increased ketones, there's abdominal pains and vomiting. With more vomiting, there's more a loss of potassium. Again, acidosis will cause phosphate loss. Acidosis will cause um, for small breathing, of course, after um, the induction of um, the baroreceptors, which instruct uh, uh, the baroreceptors in the brain, hence instructing the lungs to hyperventilate. So the patients will present with post small breathing to uh, release extra 
uh, acid. And so all this uh, will lead to dehydration. And of course, uh, dehydration leads to acute kidney injury. Prolonged dehydration will lead to shock, um, tense coma. Um, so basically, a patient with type 1 diabetes will present with fatigue, will present with weight loss, will present with thirst or polydipsia, polyuria, dehydration. If the patient have the patient has not been diagnosed early, they may uh, present in uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, of course, with um, vomiting, abdominal pain, of uh, course, small breathing, and a number of them may be in coma and or shock. So this is basically what we have uh, been saying, but it's important to know that unfortunately, majority of our patients are not presenting with classical symptoms of type 1 diabetes, rather they are presenting in DKA. And this means that this, this is a missed, um, a missed opportunity and um, there's increased risk of mortalities and future complications. In a study, again, that was done in KNH, in the same, same study, we found that over 90% of the patients with type 1 diabetes are initially presenting in the hospital with DKA. So what are we doing wrong that um, our statistics are that high? These patients may also present with recurrent uh, infections, or it may not even be uh, recurrent, just otitis media, PV candidiasis or oral thrush, uh, skin infections which are pyogenic. Some of them may present with um, secondary enuresis, so they were actually previously toilet trained, but now they develop enuresis, nocturia, um, and as we are saying, um, diaparash or monoidal vaginitis in teenager girls. So misdiagnosis can actually occur and it does occur and we actually feel it's occurring depending on uh, where we are coming from. You can misdiagnose these patients as having gastroenteritis if they just come with vomiting. If you are in a malaria endemic area, you can misdiagnose them as having cerebral malaria because they have come with fatigue, they have come with vomiting, and they have come with coma or altered consciousness. The same children can be misdiagnosed as meningitis. We have seen cases where these children are misdiagnosed as having acute abdomen, and they almost land in a theater for operation, yet they, what they have is basically decay with the increased ketones. Uh, because of that for small breathing, again, these patients can easily be misdiagnosed as having pneumonia. Patients with dehydration is acute kidney injury because of uh, the polyuria can be misdiagnosed as just having acute kidney injury with sepsis. And because of the weight loss, uh, they may uh, be easily be misdiagnosed as TB or even HIV and commonly as malnutrition. And when you make a diagnosis of malnutrition, what happens is in those 10 steps of management of malnutrition, we have administration of glucose uh, or dextrose. So this is a patient who, is, who has weight loss, is dehydrated and has hyperglycemia. You make a diagnosis of malnutrition, you give dextrose, you're basically worsening the, the problem. And this, are, this is a patient who can succumb but we may never know that the child had type 1 diabetes because perhaps we never check the sugars. So having said that, I just want to us to look at this and feel free to comment in the chat. Um, we have J.O., a 12-year-old weighing 80 uh, kilos, presents with vomiting, abdominal pain, has a two-week history of polydipsia and polyuria. He reports to have lost 10 kilos. That is actually a report from the mother that the, the clothes are loose and uh, he approximated that this boy could have lost 10 kilos of weight in the previous three weeks. On examination, uh, there were reduced levels of consciousness. The boy had severe dehydration, had deep acidotic breath, and the sugars were unrecordably high and the urine ketones were three plus. pH and bicarbonates were not done because of resource limitation. So having looked at this case, what is the likely diagnosis? Is it type one or type two diabetes? Of course, we know the child is in, in a hyperglycemic crisis that is uh, 
ketoacidosis. So is it type one or type two? So just type in the chat and we'll uh, get the, the answers. And how would you differentiate the two? Okay, keep on typing your answers. I can see some answers coming in. So we have... Um, some are saying it's type 1 diabetes because of ketonuria, type 1 diabetes. Presentation of DKE is most likely type 1 diabetes. Um, it's type 2 diabetes as child is overweight. Uh, type 2 reason, the child weighs 80 kilos. Type 1, type 1 uh, ketones. So I think in the interest of time, I will leave it um, at that. So. So this child had presented in DKA was overweight, 80 kilos. Uh, and remember he had lost weight. So looks like the boy was actually 90 kilos prior. So out of that, we ordered for a autoantibodies. And what we found was um, GAD65 was positive and IA2 was positive and c peptide was low. So out of this, we made a diagnosis of type one diabetes. And it was important we do this because Islet antibodies testing can be very helpful as obesity affects a greater proportion of youth. So it's possible to develop type 1 diabetes and be obese, causing confusion with type 2, with type 2 diabetes, just like in this case. So in such circumstances, any type of islet onto antibody uh, positivity establishes the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. So we briefly look at type 2 diabetes, but um, of course, this will be handled by my colleague in future. So type 2 diabetes is characterized by hyperglycemia due to insulin resistance and a relative impairment in insulin secretion due to beta cell dysfunction that could occur as a result of uh, persistent hyperglycemia causing glucotoxicity or lipotoxicity or other mechanisms. And it's uh, considered a polygenic disease that is aggravated by environmental factors with low physical activity and excessive caloric intake. So the etiology is genetic and uh, uh, we have the genetic and physiologic components and lifestyle factors, including excess energy intake, insufficient physical activity and increased sedentary behavior are uh, the risk to type 1 diabetes. And so for here you find that um, there's insulin resistance and as a result of that defect in signaling, uh, defect in signaling to glucose transporters causing um, hyperinsulinemia with reduced uh, glucose uptake by the cells. So what happens is the patient will develop a peripheral insulin resistance, and then the pancreas will compensate by increasing insulin secretion causing hyperinsulinemia. However, sustained hyperglycemia over time results in beta cell exhaustion with declining uh, insulin secretion um, and hence um, requiring uh, insulin to protect the cell. Peptide. So the treatment is lifestyle adjustments or hypoglycemic agents and may require oxygen, um, may require insulin. So for type 2 diabetes in uh, youth, uh, there are some subtle signs that you can actually pick out to make a diagnosis. And number one is acanthosis nigricans. Like you can see there's this velvet darkening of the skin uh, on the neck and also around the axilla and also other folds in the body. So this uh, darkening is not because the, the, the patient does not shower well. It's actually telling you that there's insulin resistance. 
what we call acanthosis migricans. These patients may also present with hypertension, uh, hyperlipidemia, and an alcoholic fatty liver disease and polycystic ovary disease. Then we have um, monogenic diabetes that comprise of uh, MODI or uh, maturity onset diabetes of the young and neonatal diabetes. So for MODI or maturity onset diabetes of the youth, uh, what happens here is um, it's autosomal dominant as a result of a genetic defect in insulin uh, secretion. So it is a familiar form of mild, you may have ketones or absent ketones, but uh, it largely presents during adolescence or early adulthood, uh, usually with an onset of before 25 years of age. However, it may initially be misclassified as having type 2 diabetes. So molecular diagnosis is vital in uh, zeroing in on the diagnosis. The neonatal diabetes is a, a form of monogenic form of uh, diabetes that occurs in children who have less than six months of life, it really may present as late as nine to 12 months of age. So you suspect this when there's an absence of diabetes autoantibodies, but um, uh, objectively you do genetic testing to get the exact genetic defect, which may actually necessitate you to um, manage this child differently. And then we have mitochondrial diabetes, as we had said, uh, commonly associated with sensory neural deafness and is characterized by progressive non autoimmune beta cell feeling. And the transmission is maternal in nature. So typically, it occurs in young adults, but may also occur in children and adolescents. Then we have what we call LADA or latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. Um, so what happens here is there's destruction of the beta cells, but the, the it's the destruction is actually has a lower speed and it's mild as opposed to type 1 diabetes. So the criteria by Immunology for Diabetes Society states that uh, you can make a diagnosis of LADA when the on onset age is greater than 35 years. You have positive islet autoantibodies and insulin independence for at least six months after diagnosis. So meaning that you can actually put this uh, patient on insulin and then after six months, we find that um, they may not require uh, that insulin. Uh, however, it shares genetic susceptibility and clinical phenotype with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And one wonders whether it's a continuum between the two extremes. Then we have stress hyperglycemia occurring in uh, children presenting with acute illness uh, and febrile illnesses, usually in around 5% of children um, presenting to an emergency department. So it's always good to check the sugars for any child with the fetal anemia. So what is the difference now between these uh, three types of uh, diabetes that we have said? For type 1, we have said the genetics are polygenic, or the mode of inheritance polygenic in nature. Um, age of onset, usually more than uh, 6 to 12 months. And the clinical presentation is most often acute and rapid. In our study, we found an average of around 18 days from the, uh, the onset of symptoms to the presentation of these patients in the hospital. And then um, there is uh, autoimmunity. The ketosis is common. Uh, obesity is basically like what is found in the population. We do not have features of insulin resistance like acanthosis migricans. And um, in children, in young people, you'll find that uh, it affects more than 90% of pediatrics and young children and young adults. Then um, for parents who have diabetes, you'll find that two to four percent uh, of their siblings will uh, also have type 1 diabetes. In type 2, it's polygenic, usually. Uh, onset is uh, pubertal or later, and the clinical presentation varies. It may actually be slow or insidious to severe, and uh, uh, usually there is no autoimmunity. Uh, ketosis is rare, and there's increased frequency of obesity, especially in adolescents and young adults. There's acanthosis nigricans, and um, the frequency um, in most uh, countries is less than 10% of type 2 that is now in pediatrics and adolescents. However, in Japan, it's uh, more 60 to 80%. Uh, we don't know why, but there could be a reason. And then um, for, uh, remember we say there's familial aggregation where 80% uh, 
uh, of uh, children may have parents with type 2 diabetes. And then for monogenic diabetes, the, uh, the, the genetics is monogenic, one single genetic defect, often post-pubertal, but you may have uh, others like and neonatal diabetes that can less than six to 12 months. And uh, the clinical presentation is usually variable. There's no autoimmunity and ketosis is common in neonatal diabetes, but rare in other forms. And uh, what you can see is these students do not have features of insulin resistance. And the frequency in the population is one to 6%. And as so to, so somal dominant, so more than 90% of these children will also have parents with, um, with diabetes. So just to give us hope as healthcare workers, we look at this Elizabeth uh, Haggis, the daughter of United States politician Charles Evans. Elizabeth was diagnosed with diabetes at the age of 11. In August 1922, she was started on insulin, the impurified form from the dog's pancreas. She survived, graduated from college, got married with three children, and she died suddenly of a heart attack at 74 years. And then we have um, this uh, US Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. She was diagnosed diabetes at the age of seven years and she has lived with that uh, with proper career progression to an extent that you can now see her here uh, amongst the supreme court uh, judges so it's important to give hope to our patients to, to ensure that this good place in control so lastly we see this young boy here with the dog praying and um, first of all, thanking God for the discovery of insulin, for the scientists, for our fathers who worked so hard, and also the doc that has been very instrumental in um, the, in the insulin discovery and just helping uh, some of these patients live up to 70 plus years. And of course, he's making a prayer that God may help um, more scientists and give them wisdom to discover a more permanent solution to management of type one diabetes. Thank you very much. These are the references. I want to acknowledge Dr. Mungai and Dr. Hewat for um, sharing some of the photos and slides that I used in this. Thank you so much, over to you, Dr. Priska. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Omalwa, for that excellent and enlightening introduction to diabetes in children. Um, we have lots of questions uh, in the Q&A chat, so we'll proceed uh, right to that. So I have lumped the questions into diagnosis and uh, etiology. So I will um, read out two questions at a go. So the first question is from Patrick Lumumba, who asks, how can I clinically diagnose diabetes without a laboratory test right in the rural area? And then he also asks, Apart from fasting blood sugar and random blood sugar indicators, which other tests can I do to diagnose diabetes? Okay, thank you so much, Patrick. Um, I think we said uh, you make a diagnosis um, when you have uh, classical features or signs of uh, diabetes, that is uh, a patient who has polydipsia and, and polyvia. Uh, and, and or weight loss. And on top of that, you confirm that there's hyperglycemia. So a random blood sugar should be available even in the remotest area. Uh, so a random blood sugar of more than 11.1, we should be able to make a diagnosis with those uh, clinical um, symptoms. And then of course we said uh, you can use HbA1c, usually if it's more than 6.5 um, diagnosis. And if you're in a setup where you're able to do the oral glucose tolerance test, you can do that and uh, check the sugars to our postprandial, then you can um, make a diagnosis if it's more than 11.1. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then Carol Abida asks, how do you solve the issue of heterogeneity during diagnosis? How do we solve the issue of hetero heterogeneity? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, exactly what she meant on that. Okay, so maybe Carol, you can elaborate further and just post in the Q&A chat, just elaborate the question further. 
Uh, Antonio Nyango is asking, given the chronicity of type 2 diabetes and the role of insulin resistance in its pathogenesis, is there a test for insulin resistance before development of overt diabetes or prediabetes in patients with risk factors? Uh, for example, serial insulin level testing. And then in the second part of the question, he's asking, should there be a paradigm shift uh, uh, include testing for insulin resistance in uh, diabetes uh, screening in addition to random blood sugar and HbA1c. Okay, thank you so much for that question. Yes, you can actually uh, test level of insulin resistance in patients with type 2 diabetes. You are able to measure the insulin levels and our labs are able to do that. Uh, however, there's a uh, what we call a HOMA uh, index that basically helps you to, um, to test the insulin resistance. And so you are able to basically use that criteria to um, determine whether this particular patient um, can benefit from the oral hypoglycemic agents or the resistance lowering uh, drugs. So I think um, I would not go into details of the HOMA index. I would ask you to check it out. Thank you. Um, so, okay, there's an anonymous attendee who's asking, can we do autoantibodies as screening tests for type 1 diabetes for children at risk with normal blood sugar? And then a question related to that uh, from an anonymous attendee is, are beta cell function tests routinely available in Kenyatta National Hospital? Okay, thank you so much for that question. Uh, routinely doing the antibodies for children who have not manifested uh, the clinical symptoms of diabetes may not have uh, economic value unless you're doing that for research purposes. Uh, because remember, these uh, autoantibodies are fairly expensive. From the labs that we are using, we're well, just doing two autoantibodies and a C peptide, you'll find that the cost is around 15 to 20,000. So, or you may do a test today in a genetically predisposed uh, individual and you find that uh, they have negative antibodies, but later on they may develop antibodies. So you may actually find that unless you uh, have enough resources or you're doing it for research purposes, it may not really be uh, helpful. For the other question about uh, the pancreatic uh, function test in Kenyatta, uh, I think Dr. Priska, you can answer that. So for the, uh, the, the antibodies, the pancreatic antibodies, they are currently not available at Kenyatta National Hospital, but they're all available locally in private labs. However, we have C-peptide uh, available at Kenyatta National Hospital. So that's what we currently have. So um, Odongo Odio is asking, what is the cost of taking these genetic tests for type 1 diabetes? Um, when you're talking about the genetic tests you're, for type 1, you're basically looking at the HLA haplotypes and uh, the BRP1, uh, BR4. For the cost, I really am not aware about that. But I know the cost of uh, screening or something like neonatal diabetes is not cheap, depending on the lab, because most of the labs that we send our patients to are external. <laughs> the varies from um, to as much as high as uh, 100,000 plus, because remember they also need to screen the parents. But for the uh, the haplotypes, I'm not I'm not aware about the cost. Thank you. Um, then uh, with regards to etiology, John Lugado is asking in a county where uh, that I work. From the number of malnutrition cases has always been high, and the clients benefits from the ready-to-use therapeutic feeds. In so doing, those that aren't malnourished and they get this supplement from either the shops or from the real beneficiaries whom their parents sell uh, sell them to buy other meals for the family. This has led to an increase in the number of type one diabetes. Could there be a relationship uh, to the supplement? So I think he's asking if there's a relationship uh, between uh, supplements and the development of type 1 diabetes? Um, thank 
you for that question. It's, uh, I really don't know because remember we touched on nutrition and various other hypotheses that predispose these uh, children to type 1 diabetes. The question I'll be asking is, is it type 1 diabetes that we are dealing with? And what are the contents of these supplements? Because I know the ready to use therapeutic fits, um, the major ingredient is peanuts. Um, and um, um, we don't really have conclusive studies uh, in terms of what nutritional supplement will predispose a child to type one diabetes as opposed to the other. So perhaps it will be interesting to conduct a study and confirm that actually there's a, a causal relationship between the two. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a, an anonymous attendee asking, uh, CA head of pancreas has recently uh, been seen to increase cases of diabetes, even in uh, pediatric patients. How early can it be diagnosed? Uh, thank you for that uh, question. I'm not aware about it. It's interesting uh, uh, question because personally, I'm not aware that we have increasing cases of CA head of pancreas in the pediatric population. Um, but yes, from the little knowledge I know, it is um, usually one of those cancers that are a little bit hard to diagnose early because of the insidious onset and uh, the way the, um, the symptoms manifest. So I think um, if there's any onco oncology specialist in the audience, they can uh, give us an answer to that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. If there's a specialist in the in the, in the, among the attendees, you can just let us know. Um, then there's a, sorry. So there's a, a question from an anonymous attendee who's asking, there is talk of diabetes reversal in type two diabetes. What are the chances of type one, type one reversal? Okay, thank you for that question. It's also important as we answer this to go back to look at the pathophysiology of type one diabetes. We are talking of the beta cell uh, destruction. So is reversal possible? I'm not sure, but can it be halted? It's possible because we have a number of uh, our studies that are ongoing in an attempt to just protect the C-peptide, like to stall or stop the progression of type one diabetes from stage one to overt uh, diabetes in stage three. So we have a number of studies that are happening, uh, including even early institution of insulin in patients who have not developed overt uh, type one diabetes in use of um, various immunoglobulins and all sorts of uh, treatments. So reversal, I'm not sure that we have any uh, study that has uh, looked at that, but in terms of stopping the progression, we have a number of studies looking at that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So, um, Josphat uh, Wanjau is asking, is it a must for long-term use of autoimmune drugs to cause type 2 diabetes? Sorry, come again, is it? Is it a must? For like, I think he's asking, is it all? Uh, maybe he wants to know about the incidence of uh, or the association between autoimmune drugs and cause uh, causation of type two diabetes. Autoimmune or immunosuppressive drugs. Uh, he's talking about autoimmune drugs. I think he might be. He probably means uh, immunosuppressive drugs. Yeah. Yeah, so they have actually been shown, especially um, in terms of increased dose and prolonged usage. So uh, that one has been shown to increase uh, uh, insulin resistance and hence diabetes. However, it can be reversed in some cases uh, when um, the immunosuppressive drugs are stopped. But in other cases, up to around 34%, uh, you may find that um, uh, the patient may develop permanent diabetes. Thank you. But I don't know the incidence. Okay, thank you. Timothy Ryung is asking, okay, he's saying great presentation. So he asks, has there been any documented association between onset of type 1 diabetes and worsening of 
pre-existing diabetes with pubertal growth spurt. Okay, I'm, I'm listening to that question is like, there are three questions in one. Is it a uh, type one diabetes onset and then worsening of uh, diabetes in pubertal growth spurt? I think I will uh, choose to answer it this way. We know that during pubertal growth spurt, uh, we normally have uh, an increase in sex steroids with concomitant rise in growth hormone that gives us now the growth spurt. And the sex steroids and growth hormone increase um, normally cause insulin resistance. So you find unless you adjust the dose of insulin according to the pubertal status, you may find that uh, we may have a problem controlling the sugars. On the other hand, if you do not control the sugars in a child with pre-existing type one diabetes, they are likely to have a delay in pubertal growth spurt. So that is delayed puberty. So proper glucose uh, control is very instrumental in ensuring that is, there is growth and development, including puberty. Thank you. I hope I've answered his question. If you can add, Chakriska, if I've not done it well. Yeah, I, I think you have answered the question. So there are several questions on this. Uh, um, so is it possible to for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes to coexist in an individual? And uh, someone is asking additionally, someone with, can someone with type 1 diabetes later on develop insulin resistance and therefore type 2 diabetes? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's actually possible for the two to coexist. And that's why in managing patients with type 1 diabetes, we also focus on proper weight uh, control. Because you may have type 1 diabetes, but if you are sedentary and you, have, you are overweight, uh, you may develop uh, insulin resistance and hence uh, type 2 diabetes. So the two can coexist. And so follow-up and growth monitoring and adjustment of insulin plus physical activity is important to ensure that the child does not develop in resistance. Thank you. So Daniel Njuguna asks, is alcohol intake during pregnancy a predisposing factor for type 1 diabetes mellitus? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, my answer will be, will be no. I've not seen any, point, any literature pointing towards that. Uh, but of course, intake of some of uh, um, this, whether it's nutritional uh, supplements or alcohol or um, uh, just such intake of, um, uh, uh, they may affect uh, the genes, what we call epigenetics. So the child may eventually be born, but later on develop metabolic syndrome with perhaps development of type 2 diabetes. Do we have uh, studies showing the relationship between the two? Maybe they are there, but I've not um, uh, come across them. So it's important that we check. Type 1 diabetes, I would say no. Okay, thank you. Uh, an anonymous attendee is asking, how do you carry out an OGTT? Must the patient be starved prior? And uh, examples of the 75 grams anhydrous sugar. Okay. Um, thank you um, for that question. And Dr. Kiska, you'll also assist me in that. So OGTT, you would want to carry out this test. If um, the patient has dysglycemia and you want to know whether um, uh, we have um, uh, diabetes or we have um, just uh, glu uh, impaired glucose tolerance. So what you do here is before you administer the 75 grams of anhydrous glucose, you want to measure the, uh, the sugar levels record uh, down and then you pick now the 75 grams of the anhydrous glucose. And anhydrous glucose, um, from what we know, is basically a highly purified uh, form of dextrose um, that contains around 99% uh, glucose. So what you're basically intaking is pure glucose and it's not moist 
um, usually well packaged in small particles can be found in certain uh, in pharmacies and uh, certain hospitals for basically that purpose of IGTT. So you measure your 75 grams and how do you measure? It can come already measured or you can use your tablespoon to approximate. One tablespoon is around 12 to 15 grams. So if you're using 75 grams, then that basically translates to around um, five tablespoons. You put in 200 ml of uh, water, uh, Cold is uh, warm is preferable for dissolution, but you can use cold uh, to prevent nausea. Then the patient ingests that uh, slowly, finishes at a sitting, and then two hours later, you check your glucose levels. If your glucose levels are more than 11.1, then you make a diagnosis of diabetes. If your glucose levels are between 7.8 to 11.1, then you make a diagnosis of impaired glucose tolerance. If uh, it's less than uh, 7.8, then uh, that is basically a normal patient without diabetes of uh, impaired glucose tolerance. So examples of um, anhydrous glucose that are local, um, it's, it's, it's uh, Dr. Priska, what can we use here? Um, I, I think it's just the normal glucose and the laboratories normally would actually even provide that if you're doing it in a laboratory. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we actually have, uh, uh, we have what? We have uh, already pre-formulated anhydrous glucose by the manufacturers just specifically for the OGTT. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Carol Abida asks, it's sad that the incidence of type 1 diabetes is increasing yearly. I wonder what the mortal mortality rate is. Any insights, Dr. Wamalwa? Yeah, um, it's, it's true. Uh, we have uh, increasing uh, cases of type 1 diabetes. Mortality rates as a result of uh, uh, type 1 diabetes, I don't think we have local data. And the limitation is uh, we may not have accurate data because we are not making a diagnosis in all the cases. Remember, more than 50% are dying undiagnosed. So we don't know how many we are losing out of this diagnosis. So perhaps just out of uh, modeling from uh, the uh, statistics from different hospitals and at community levels, then we can get the real mortality uh, percentage. But for now, I've not come across locally. Okay. There's an anonymous attendee who's asking, I think what he means to ask is if there's any association between neonatal jaundice and uh, neonatal diabetes. Mm, thanks for that. I'm not sure we have any association um, unless the child has other comorbid conditions and other um, syndromes, but have not come across any. Okay. So Janet Chebet is asking, what is the relationship between diabetes and TB? She's also asking about proper storage of insulin in a rural setting. I think that one will be addressed tomorrow in the session of, on insulin. So maybe you could add, answer the one on diabetes and TB. Yeah, I did mention that uh, patients coming with uh, type 1 diabetes may be misdiagnosed uh, or just diabetes of whatever form may be misdiagnosed as TB because of the wasting or weight loss. Uh, but remember also patients who have uh, diabetes normally uh, are at a high risk of getting uh, different infections because of uh, reduced immunity. Uh, because high sugars, especially if they are chronic uh, hyperglycemia, they affect the functionality of the white blood cells. So they are at a higher risk of uh, TB and other infections. Okay, thank you. So an anonymous attendee is asking, kindly comment on calcium channel blockers in reducing the destruction of beta cells through increasing C-peptide. Okay, the use of calcium channel uh, blockers. So basically this is uh, taking us back to at the molecular level of, uh, of the beta cell, uh, how the beta cell works because what happens is for the insulin to be released, there has to be an influx of, of calcium into the beta cell uh, after the, the, cell is, uh, the cell membrane is depolarized. So if you're giving the calcium channel blocker, 
then it means that uh, we, don't, we do not have that um, calcium influx into the cell. And as a result, there's no insulin uh, secretion. So if there's no insulin secretion, it means that this child will develop diabetes, right? I hope my reasoning is right. Um, but I have not come across uh, personally the studies on calcium channel blockers and the protection of the C-peptide. Perhaps it's, it's something that um, we can check up after this. But Dr. Priske, if you okay. have any insight, you can add. Uh, thank you. I haven't come across uh, that use. Uh, unless maybe in research purposes, but I have not come across it being used at this time. So Philomena Mudoka asked, during the time of COVID-19, there was an increase in cases of newly diagnosed diabetes. What is the connection? Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, it's true. We actually had um, observational studies reporting a rise in cases of type 1 diabetes. And um, COVID, like any other virus, would cause uh, inflammation, destruction of the beta cells, and then, of course, as we said, deformed beta cells and um, recognition by the antibodies as um, the antigens and then uh, autoimmunity. So the same way we have seen a rise in other autoimmune conditions like um, thyroid disorders uh, during COVID, I think it's the same mechanism for type 1 diabetes. Autoimmunity. Okay, thank you. Um, Professor Ruth Ndwati was asking about the case you presented, the case with obesity, 80 kilos at 12 years. What was the thyroid hormone profile? Okay, thank you so much, Prof. We actually did um, uh, our TFTs at admission and also TFTs we have done, I think, uh, twice during follow-up and they were normal. Okay, thank you. Then um, Carol Abida is asking alcohol intake in pregnancy. Uh, okay, she's commenting that alcohol intake in pregnancy can predispose the child to type 2 diabetes. Any comment on that, Phoebe? Mm, I think it can, uh, looking at, uh, oh, I think what we had mentioned earlier, uh, it may affect the epigenetics and then uh, future metabolic syndrome and enzymes in resistance and type 2. But in terms of the exact mechanism, uh, we need to go and check it out. Okay. Uh, can type 1 diabetes be diagnosed at birth? And then the second question from Perez Obonyo, she's asking, what, what is the remission rate of type 1 diabetes? Maybe you can take those two. Remission rate. Uh, hi. Okay, that's a difficult question. Um, do we have remission? Uh, I think we'll be looking at it uh, in terms of um. No, I, I really don't have an answer. We do we we don't remit children who are diagnosed with type one diabetes. We need to tell them that they're actually on lifelong therapy because of uh, that beta cell destruction. However. A number of them after a few weeks or a few months of uh, initial treatment, they may go into a uh, honeymoon period where the beta cell function uh, partially recovers because you have now dealt with um, the glucotoxicity that may have worsened or aggravated the beta cell destruction. So you will find that this um, recovery of the beta cells may take around uh, uh, a few weeks to months, and a few, very few cases may go uh, to up to a year. But that's just uh, a recovery of the beta cells. And a number of our patients go into honeymoon period. Thank you. Okay, and uh, someone had asked, can type 1 diabetes be diagnosed in, the, in an unit? Yeah, thanks. Uh, as we had said, if a patient presents with uh, diabetes at less than six months of age, you have to really think of a neonatal diabetes as opposed to type 1 diabetes. Um, and so the first thing you would want to do is uh, basically ask yourself, how are they uh, autoantibodies? Most of the times they'll be negative, basically now just pointing towards neonatal diabetes. So type 1 diabetes in neonates, it's a very rare phenomenon. You have to think of neonatal diabetes. 
Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Amalwa. I see our time is uh, is gone. Um, I would just, uh, I think at this point, invite you to make your closing remarks. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Priska, for, for that. And uh, thank you so much, um, our dear listeners, for that engaging moment of question and answer. I think my take home uh, uh, statement will be, let's check the glucose levels for all our children coming to the outpatient area. As my teacher normally say, every child coming to the outpatient, think of that child as having type 1 diabetes unless otherwise. So we should never uh, just treat a patient and discharge or admit without checking the sugar levels. It's possible that we are losing a number of children uh, undiagnosed uh, of type 1 diabetes, and yet we have uh, insulin available, have commodities available, and support from uh, various organizations. So I think that would be my take home message. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amalwa, for that uh, very enlightening session. Um, I, there were many questions. Unfortunately, we could not take all of them. But since we are going to have this series for the next uh, couple of weeks, um, I'm sure they will be addressed uh, during each of those sessions. For those who are asking about the availability of the presentation, this presentation will be uploaded on the KNH UN, the KNH Research um, YouTube channel uh, in the coming days. So you'll be able to access it from there. Uh, I think uh, we can end the session now. Thank you very much for all those who attended and uh, have a good evening. Bye-bye.